is actually his son, David Rudy, filling in because Paul is on vacation in Minnesota still. So he's enjoying the nice weather up there. We actually all just got back um, from Minnesota. Well, I was back a couple weeks ago. Ryan and Daniel just got back more recently. Um, so, yeah, he's still up there fishing. We had a, a really good year of fishing this year. Um, posted some pictures on Facebook, I think. So if you want to check those out, you can go on our page. But we have uh, really kind of our regular cast and crew here today, plus one. So first and foremost, we have Dr. Gertz. Dr. Gertz, good morning. Uh, good to be here. We have certified financial planner professional Daniel Rudy, all the way from Texas. Good morning. And Ryan Repco, also a certified financial planner and regular guest on the show. And all the way from Champaign. Good morning. All right. Well, before we get into the show, I have our, our kind of standard disclosures, and I don't have these memorized, so I'm going to go ahead and just read them off. Um, first and foremost, you can call in with your questions at 217-356-9397, or you can text us on the Castle Heating and Cooling text line at 351-5357. I think the last time we had a show with all junior advisors, we had more calls than ever. So I don't know if people just are testing us and making sure we know our stu stuff or what. But yeah, feel free to call in with your questions. That always makes the shows more interesting, I think, for the listeners. And then finally, you can email in with your questions at talk at wdws.com. Uh, finally, we want to welcome those uh, tuning in on Facebook Live. You can always uh, view our shows in person, and see the video of us ta talking. Uh, really not much more to it than that um, on Facebook Live during the shows. And then there's also live recordings after the fact, or not live recordings, but recordings after the fact uh, posted on our Facebook page. And then some important disclosures. It's important to recognize that past performance is not an indication of future results. Uh, you shouldn't make any investment decisions without first consulting your own financial advisor and conducting your own research and due diligence. That's just good common sense. We were just talking about this before the show and we were mentioning how, you know, when you're on a show, we have to try to give helpful advice, but at the same time, really we don't know everyone's each individual circumstances. And at the end of the day, to give individualized advice, you need the full picture of someone's kind of finances. And, you know, you should never really just take what you hear off a radio show and implement it yourself without doing your own research or talking to your own financial advisor, like our disclosure says. Like I said, that's just good common sense. So with that out of the way, I want to start with a little bit of economics. So I saw an article that said we are now in the longest U.S. economic expansion in history. So, Dr. Gertz, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's uh, good news in the sense that we had uh, probably the largest downturn, uh, certainly since the Great Depression in 2007 through 2009. And since that time, it's been uh, straight up. But uh, the slope has not been particularly steep. So we have two things has happened. This is the longest in history, but it's not the most robust in history. The growth rate has been somewhat slower than many other recoveries. But uh, it may be uh, that you give up one thing for another instead of having uh, rapid growth with uh, a downturn in seven years or five years. We've had slow growth over this long period of time. The other thing which is uh, uh, unusual is that uh, there's been almost no uh, upturn in inflation during this whole period. So we're still, after 10 years or more, uh, at an inflation rate of uh, 2% or less. And instead of the, of the usual situation where the Federal Reserve is worrying about how do we keep the inflation rate uh, under control, they're, they're worried about how do we keep it up to our goal of 2%. So that's a very unusual kind of situation. And it's more unusual uh, in one sense because I don't think anyone knows exactly why. Uh, there was an article recently by Robert Barrow, who's an economist at uh, Harvard, and he said that, uh, again, the, this inflation situation has been uh, very modest, but he said that there's no real uh, one overarching kind of explanation for that, whether it's uh, more competition from abroad or uh, things that, or more pressure on wages or whatever. But anyway, uh, we sort of take the, the positive with it and go. But so, so the concern has been, unlike almost any other previous situation, not how do we keep the inflation rate down, it's how do we keep it up to the goal of 2%. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's interesting just hearing that too, because I remember just early on in this bull market and you know, when, when we were doing the quantitative easing and, and just yeah. basically adding money, one of the big concerns was people thought there was going to be really high inflation and then it turns out it's almost the opposite. Right. The, it turned out, I think, that uh, quantitative easing was 
done for a different purpose and had a different result. Uh, one aspect of monetary policy is try to lower interest rates to encourage more investment and more uh, consumer spending in housing and cars and things of that sort, which is the traditional uh, kind of monetary policy. But the quantitative easing was more recapitalizing the uh, financial market. So it turned out, that even though it was a huge expansion, it wasn't a traditional expansion of the money supply and, and didn't have the, the result that we, we found here. The other thing is that it seems that now that the, uh, the market's uh, uh, very dependent upon interest rates. So uh, we had two things happening uh, in the last couple of weeks. One is that uh, there was expectation that interest rates would, would be lowered and that, that had an impact on the market in a positive way. And then we had one of these unusual situations where uh, good news is bad news. It came out with a very strong uh, job growth number, which you would think would be a, a plus for the economy and stimulate the, park, uh, the stock market. But instead, uh, people started to fear, well, if, if the economy is doing well, maybe they won't lower interest rates. And that had a, a minor impact on the, the market the last week or so. So it's an interesting situation. We're in, new, we're in uh, uncharted waters. Uh, there's a saying among uh, economists and, and uh, financial people that uh, uh, expansions don't die of old age. That something has to happen. So, again, something's going to happen someday, sometime. But there doesn't seem to be any particular reason that it's going to happen very soon. So most people believe that uh, there will be no recession uh, during the next uh, six months or maybe a year, although there may be a slowing of the economy. And Dr. Gertz, you bring up a point that I was going to mention, so you beat me to it, that yeah. they don't die of old age, whereas so, so many times we hear from people, well, the, the economy is doing so well, it's been doing so well for so long, it has to start going down, yeah. right? That's the mentality that what goes up must go down. And, and over time, yes, but so many people think that that's like a timing opportunity to get in in the market, get out of the market. And that's one of those things you have to somewhat dispel that just because it's old age doesn't mean it's going to end just because of its age. It ends, like you said, because of an event of something of, of nature. Yeah. And there's a certain uh, degree of intrinsic unpredictability. For example, the California earthquakes recently, uh, everyone knows there's going to be an earthquake in California sometime, but you can't say, well, since it's been 10 years since the last one, we're going to have one tomorrow. It could be another 20 or 30 years. It could be tomorrow. So mm -hmm. again, uh, uh, timing is not uh, not something that most people sh should try to practice in terms of uh, investments in, in and out of the market. Right. And we've talked about this on the radio show before, where even if you could time the economy, if you, if you could accurately forecast the economy in the short run, that wouldn't even help you from an investment standpoint, because the investment, really the stock market, in the short run is not super highly correlated to to the economy and and it's usually a, a leading indicator so right. usually by the time you know, the economy is doing something the market's already reacted to it the market goes down before <laughs> before a recession typically yeah. and it goes up before we start realizing that oh we're in a recovery so yeah and you also have to you have to know when to buy and when to sell if you're, you're going to be a timer so in 2000 Eight, the market went down, uh, ended up going down close to 50%. But you might have said, well, if it's gone down 25%. I'm going to get back in. And you would have uh, ridden it down even even uh, further. So you really can't can't tell. So again, uh, the, the, my strategy, and I think to, to, to a certain extent, uh, uh, your strategy as well is that uh, you don't have to know about these. You don't have to know about individual stocks. You don't try to guess whether GM's going up or down or uh, Google is a good buy or not buy. You, you buy a little bit of everything. And secondly, you don't try to uh, guess the market because even people who invest in, uh, in uh, passive funds tend not to do as well as the funds itself because they come and go at the wrong time. Yeah, and I think you know that's something that I've been talking about more and more is I think people, most people think that investing is all about predicting stuff. It's about predicting what the market's going to do or predicting which stock's going to perform the best. And I always remind clients and prospective clients, you don't need to predict anything to have a successful investment experience. You're rewarded just for owning companies and sharing in their earnings and profits and their share price increases over time. You're rewarded for lending money to companies and just getting your money back plus interest. I think a lot of people overcomplicate investing and they do make it all about having a crystal ball and that really is a loser's game, and it, and it tends to lead to underperformance or worse performance. And you're better off just from a time and just peace of mind standpoint, just accepting the fact that you can't predict the market and just, just passively own the stock market and the bond market in kind of the appropriate ratio for your plan. Yeah, I guess what I've learned here from uh, you and your, and your father is that uh, you know, part of your uh, 
uh, contribution is not to tell people what to buy, but uh, make a decision and stick with it over the over the cycle. Yeah, exactly. That's the biggest thing. And and at the end of the day, too, I think a lot of times indecision crushes people where they're not just not sure. They're always second guessing and tinkering. And at the end of the day, it does. It gets back to that plan. Make a decision on what is an appropriate investment allocation for your financial goals and then just stick to it no matter what's going on in the economy or the market. You know, on that note, I just saw Donald Trump had a, I think it was another tweet or another quote about how India has been taking advantage of the United States yeah. and it's gone on too long and he's going to do something about it. Well, uh, again, uh, it's the same uh, story, I guess, with China and uh, maybe to a certain extent Mexico and whoever has happens to be in the, the spotlight uh, at the time. But again, India is a huge country, uh, second largest in the world, uh, has a growing uh, GDP, but not, not, not like China yet. But again, there, the impact of China on the or India on the U.S. economy probably is very, very, very small. So I, I doubt if uh, or bad that uh, President Trump thinks they're doing is having much of an impact. But again, we've said many times that uh, it's a little bit like the investment game. That if you try to uh, determine with each individual country, uh, country, are they doing more with us or less for us, and try to arrange those, it just doesn't work out. First of all, it doesn't make any difference whether we have a surplus or deficit with any one country. And generally, uh, trying to help in one area hurts in another area. So now we see the impact in the United States of uh, some of the Chinese policies in terms of uh, uh, making it hard for uh, agricultural people to export. Uh, some firms who import products are, are having trouble with the inputs being more expensive. So it's a loser's game. Uh, again, uh, uh, Trump would argue that uh, his ultimate goal is to uh, negotiate these things. But again, it's, uh, you don't negotiate with 150 countries uh, individually about every aspect <laughs> of their their trade flow. Right, and I think you know we get. I had a call the other day from a client that was concerned. It was when the the Mexico thing was yeah. going on, and and I do know this causes concern, which is why I like to talk about it on the show. And I know you know you've said you're not a huge fan of tariffs. I don't think most economists are. I think people yeah. pretty much unanimously agree they're a bad idea, that trade is a good thing. People engage in trade um, on their, of their own free will, basically, yeah. because it benefits both parties. But that being said, when, when news like this comes out, the key is not to let it panic you. And maybe it does have a very short-term impact on the stock market. Maybe it reacts you know, that day. But it's really a bad idea to change your investment allocation based on what Donald Trump's doing or what any politician's doing or what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, if you want to put a good face on I mean, the, the, uh, the president, I guess some of the Democratic candidates are, are thinking about now using tariffs as a weapon. So the, the uh, thing with Mexico was not that uh, Mexico was taking advantage of it as, as a way he asserts uh, China is. It was that he wanted to stop the uh, influx of uh, refugees and, and tariff was a weapon. So again, that's not a very good way of doing it, but maybe it's better than sending troops or right. starting a war to, to yep. stop it. All right. Well, we have uh, one question that came through um, our Slack, and it's from Bill. And he has said, what is a bear market? Who decides? And Fred, what should we worry about from an economic standpoint? So I'll take the first one. A bear market's typically de uh, defined as a decline of greater than 20%. It's just one of those financial terms that financial people use. And... The, I know I can tell you just for perspective, the average bear market is actually closer to about 30%, but the typical textbook definition is greater than 20%. Most advisors almost use it just interchangeably with a significant market decline. And the, uh, we, we maybe have uh, lost sight of this the last uh, several months, but uh, there is a, a kind of separation, uh, as David mentioned earlier, about the economy and the stock market. They're not the same thing. So a bear market might occur and the economy would be perfectly fine just going along. Uh, maybe expectations changed about future profits or something of that sort. So uh, a bear market is not the same as a downturn in the economy, but they're also, uh, as David also mentioned, it's some, the stock market sometimes is a uh, early warning about something's gonna happen. But the problem is uh, you may get two or three early warnings and only one of them will be uh, uh, result in a, a downturn in the economy, so you can't predict with any kind of certainty uh, of the economy based on the stock market. So again, right now, I think that uh, they're going in tandem. They don't always do that. Uh, and again, if we had a, a, a major, beyond a correction, a major bear market, that might also indicate that there's something on the horizon in terms of a uh, slowing of the economy. So, but again, 
uh, there's not a whole lot you could do about it. And, and is, I mean, is there really anything that you see out there that is worrisome from an economic standpoint, or is it pretty much all well, good right now? You no, know, there are always uh, uh, things that you worry about, but often the things you worry about are not the things that uh, <laughs> cause a problem in the future. But one, one of the uh, long-term con uh, concerns has been true now all through this recovery is that when you're down to uh, uh, very close to zero in terms of the interest rate, uh, what do you do if you want to stimulate the economy? The typical thing is if interest rates are 10% and the economy slows down, the, the Fed will work out uh, various things and the, the interest rates will come down. But if you're already at uh, uh, 1 or 2%, uh, the real rate uh, after you take away inflation is fairly close to zero. Your degrees of freedom have been reduced. So that's yeah. a, a problem. The other uh, problem, again, which we've worried about for a long time, is that uh, uh, the uh, economy, or the, the federal government now has a huge deficit. And again, the typical thing when you have a downturn is to uh, spend more, increase the deficit, to try to stimulate the economy. So during the uh, uh, early years of the Obama administration, we were uh, running uh, trillion dollar deficits. And the argument there was it was because of the slowing economy. Well, now we're, we're running trillion dollar deficits when the economy has been expanding for 10 years. And we also have interest rates close to zero. So the two instruments that typically are used to try to counteract a recession uh, have been deployed in a situation where we don't have a recession. So, uh, and, and again, uh, uh, Trump is now uh, badgering the Fed to try to lower interest rates uh, in a period when you would think otherwise, normally we'd have at least stable and possibly increasing right. interest rates. Interesting. So we're going to go ahead and, and move on to a couple different topics. Um, first and foremost, we've been quoted in a number of different news outlets and periodicals. So I was just going to touch on a few of those, and then we can just briefly talk about um, really what we wrote in those articles. So um, first and foremost, I was quoted in a bank rate article, and we talked about this, I think, on the last show. Um, about the Uber and Lyft IPOs. So that stands for Initial Public Offering. And basically why people are attracted to these IPOs. And sorry, my computer just turned off. And basically the takeaway was, look, there's actually research that shows IPOs in general, like on average, have worse performance than just the broad stock market. But people tend to be attracted to these things just because it's kind of like a lottery ticket event. There are the IPOs occasionally that uh, absolutely shoot the lights out and people can make a lot of money really quickly. So they look at it the same way as, like I said, buying a lottery ticket and that's just what humans tend to be attracted to. Um, and then Paul Sr. was actually quoted in Fiduciary News about zero fee mutual funds in ETFs and how investment firms could possibly offer something for free. And again, we've talked about this on the show before, but um, really he talked about how uh, you know, I think a lot of people are skeptical when they see zero fee mutual funds. And I think um, maybe excessively skeptical. And, and in the financial industry, I do think <laughs> skepticism can be healthy. Um, but I think, you know, one of the ways that they end up making money, because I think people always wonder what's the catch, is that they'll use these as essentially a, a, a way to attract people to open accounts. You know, a company like Fidelity has one, open an account, and then they might try to upsell you. So that's one of the concerns. And you see this in common marketing uh, tactics. It's You see it in the grocery store as a term called a loss leader. So they'll sell a certain product at a very low rate or maybe even lose money on, intentionally just to get shoppers in the store. The same thing is true here. They advertise a 0% fund. Gosh, how attractive is that? I can just keep all the money for myself. It brings in people to Fidelity. Then, like you said, there's other funds, of course, that they offer. They can start pouring their money into because I think generally most people don't want to switch brokers because it involves a lot of energy and potentially just annoyance. And most people, I think, for a lack of a better term, are lazy and, and happy to stay with one broker like Fidelity or whomever. So they stay there and they continue to invest and then they, Fidelity or the others, make their money on those other funds. Right. And then, so the other way that they'll make money is through a process called securities lending, um, where they literally le lend out securities to ba basically other investment companies. And then some of these companies will keep the profits from that process for themselves versus like a company like Dimensional Fund Advisors that I worked for, they would pass those profits on to the investors in their funds. So if it's a type of fund where they're keeping the profits for the company, 
it's really kind of like you as the investor are paying that cost indirectly because you're not benefiting from that. Um, so that's that's another way that you can pay a fee. But I think generally speaking, it's these are it's a good thing that we have really low investment options. I do think it's a little bit blown out of proportion because it's like, well, what's the difference between that and a fund with three basis, yeah. you know, a three basis point fee, which is 0.03%. Yeah, going, uh, when, when, uh, going back uh, 30 seconds or so, um, securities lending is a very complicated thing. And, and it's not like your mutual fund is lending out money for five years or something. Right. It, it's usually for a matter of hours. And the assertion is that there's virtually no risk, which is not quite true. There is a small amount of risk. And some of that came to, uh, to be known in the uh, financial crisis. So they are using your resources to lend to other people who have to have uh, stocks to meet some kind of, uh, of uh, norm. So again, but so again, I think that accounts for a little bit. But the, the main thing, though, is that uh, there's been a whole uh, downward pressure all the way through the market. So it used to be uh, you would maybe pay one and a half or one percent for active management. You might be able to do a, a passive for uh, twenty five uh, uh, hundredths of a, of a or twenty five basis points, and now that's gone all the way close to zero. But the, the most important thing is that all the rates have pretty much come down. There's a lot of pressure. I go to meetings, and uh, the common uh, complaint of active managers is, "How can we make money when there's so much pressure on our fees?" Yeah, because so, everyone's probably anchoring yeah. to these passive index yeah. funds. And yeah, and some people have said that uh, uh, John Bogle, who's the one who uh, at least made practical uh, passive investment, probably is the biggest innovation in uh, in the century and the last not the last hundred years or so, because now people can invest and keep an extra one percent. And we know about we've talked about the compound interest situation. So if you save one percent more or, or earn one percent more over your whole life, that's a huge amount of money. Yep. And it looks like we have a call on line one. Uh, it looks like Mike. Mike, uh, are you on the air? Yes. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing and uh, what can we do for you? Okay. Just a quick overview of where I'm at uh, briefly. Uh, I have an IRA, which I do not have to access for another five years for the minimum required distribution. Right now, I'm at 50-50 bonds and uh, equities on that. And... Um, I was just curious, it's all at Vanguard, and I just got an email from them, and they have a new low-cost fund. Uh, it's called the uh, Commodity Strategy Fund, and I'm curious if something like that would have any place in my uh, mix. Yeah, so that's a good question. So a commodities fund is very different than just like a normal stock or bond fund. So it's literally under the hood owning commodities. And, and usually, like if it's from Vanguard, I'm assuming it's a diversified commodities fund, so it's going to own different types of commodities, gold, silver, it's going to own um, things like crops and corn and just all different kinds of commodities. Mm -hmm. And so our school of thought and, and really Dimensional Fund Advisor school of thought is that when I think of commodities, I don't really see much of a purpose of adding them to an investment portfolio. People will tell you, well, they can be an inflation hedge. Well, they're really not. Well, that's, yeah, the, that's what they say. In, yeah. the, in the very long run, I think there's truth to that. But commodities can be extremely volatile. And in, so anything that's extremely volatile, sure. there's going to be times where, you know, you have inflation and the commodities performance is negative. So I don't look at it as a great inflation hedge. And if you were going to go that route, there's things that are better, like tips that directly hedge unexpected inflation. Um, and then the other mm -hmm. issue I have is the long run expected return of commodities is relatively low. So you're looking at something that has a high amount of fluctuation and a pretty low expected return. And generally speaking, I don't recommend commodities for an investment portfolio. I know I know advisors that do. They typically recommend a very small portion, like a couple percent of the portfolio. Right. And the, the question then becomes, uh, does it really make any difference? Uh, I mean, the, the argument about there are two reasons to go into commodities. One is speculation, trying to really right. get a high return, which is a extremely risky mm -hmm. business. The other is diversification. And, and the diversification comes from the fact that, at least in the past, the uh, uh, commodities market is not in sync completely with the right. uh, with the equity market. So you get some uh, situations where one goes up and one goes down, or one goes up and the other doesn't uh, go up as much. Things of that sort. But again, uh, uh, unless you put substantial uh, resources there, uh, it doesn't do you much good. Uh, Two percent 
it's not going to uh, uh, give you much sort of uh, ballast in terms of your uh, investment portfolio. Right. So I think a short answer to your question is I don't see any need to add that to your portfolio or or change your investment so, portfolio. Okay. I, I don't know how you're currently so, invested, but so I just uh, deleted the email. So thank you. But could I could I do a quick thirty second commercial for you guys? Yeah. Uh, I, well, you know, we have I, to I, no. I, we have to be careful with um, like well, testimonials. Let, let so we let yeah. me put it this way. Uh, I well, okay, then I won't. Well, you can do it if it's I about was, the show. If it's, a, it, it's about your personal relationship well, with the government, yeah. I just want to say that you know people might be uh, skeptical when somebody says come in and listen to us. We, you know, we'll tell you whether you need us or not, and and for no charge. And that's absolutely true. Because my personal experience was I wanted to retire early. It's about four years ago. I didn't know if things were good. I came in. I was told things are good. And off I went. Not a, not a penny charged. And I retired four years ago. And all, all is good. So uh, I really appreciate your show. You guys do a really good job and, and give good advice. Well, thank you. I mean, we appreciate the kind words. And like I said, we have to be careful. You know, we we didn't plant that call at all. We we are not really supposed to take testimonials, but we you know we appreciate that, and we do want the listeners to know we're not going to ever try to to give you a hard sell on anything. If you ever call or or stop into our office, that's just something we like to do to help the community out. So we talk about market time. Sorry if I violated your norms there, but. uh, Anyway, thanks oh, for your it's no uh, problem. today. Good. Thanks for your call. We talk about market timing, but uh, four years is probably a pretty good time to choose to retire. We've had uh, uh, pretty good markets the last four years. We, we you always talk about the situation where you retire and you just before the bear market comes. That's a more challenging situation. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, people who have retired in the last several years have had a, a pretty good draw. I mean, I guess if you retired right in the beginning of 2016, that was a little sque- scary at first, but then 2017 was great. I guess if you retired right at the end of 2018, you'd have to be pretty unlucky with the specific month timing to have a bad experience retiring in the last few years. So actually, I think on that related note, we're gonna jump ahead to, Daniel was quoted in an article, and one of the, the the topic of the article was, what's a simple investment solution for people, I think it was specifically for retirees who need equity exposure, but really don't have the money or knowledge to to build their own diversified portfolio or have someone else do it for them. So Daniel, what was your take on that? So I looked around at this because I was actually trying to figure out what fund to invest my girlfriend in because she had, you know, not too much money to invest. But obviously, I still want her to be globally diversified and in a low expense fund. So Dave and I actually came across Vanguard Total World Stock ETF. It's just, you know, it's obviously not for everyone, but if someone wants a globally diversified portfolio, have it with a generally low expense ratio. I mean, you really can't beat a Vanguard fund like this. Well, and I think that's what I was getting out with the last call is I think, you know, all these fund companies, they'll launch these new funds and people will think that investing needs to be more complicated than it really does. And and really at the simplest level for your equity exposure, you can build what's essentially a diversified portfolio with one fund. It owns the total global stock market. And then you don't have to worry about how to slice and dice it between large companies and small companies and value and growth and which sectors. It keeps things simple. And again, it's not saying that's what everyone should do. It's just saying, look, you don't need to overcomplicate things. There's these simple investment solutions out there. And if you don't want to be 100% stock, which very few retirees do, they even have a total bond uh, bond market index fund that you can use. So in a couple funds, you can have a globally diversified portfolio with a specific ratio of stocks to bonds. Yeah, I went to a, a meeting recently of uh, uh, dealing with uh, pension funds, and uh, it's like a bazaar with uh, all different kind of uh, exotic things, uh, you know, hedge funds and private equity and uh, and uh, uh, commodities, and virtually everything in the in the world. And someone made the observation that uh, almost every pension fund, for the last ten or the last twenty years, could have gone sixty forty with uh, a broad based. Uh, stock portfolio using passive investment in bonds and done better than they actually did with all these bells and whistles. So again, and they have the time and the money to do it, but individual investors uh, don't have access, but maybe fortunately to some of these things like hedge funds or, or uh, private equity. But again, in the long run, it probably doesn't make that, that much difference. 
yeah, like you said, most people are probably better off for it, not having to get sucked into the even possibility of investing in some of these alternative investments. Yeah, and 60, 40, uh, 60 stocks and 40 uh, bonds would have uh, beaten most pension funds, and 70, 30 would have killed them in terms of how <laughs> Right. Yep. So I think the meat and potatoes of our conversation today I'm going to go ahead and move on to is we talk a lot on this show about how important investor behavior is and how investors end up underperforming their own investments because they shoot themselves in the foot by uh, making a variety of mistakes. And I think the most common one that we talk about is selling during declines, but there's really a number of kind of nuanced different, you can call them mistakes or uh, misbehaviors that investors make that lead to worse performance. And my goal for today was let's talk about some of those things, talk about why they happen and why people make these mistakes. And hopefully <laughs> the listeners won't have to make them themselves. They can learn from other people's mistakes. Um, so the first one, like I said, and the biggest and most costly uh, mistake that someone can make is selling during a market decline or a bear market. So I'm just going to throw this out to anyone who wants to take it. But why do you think people, despite, I feel like at this point, most people know it's probably not a good idea to sell while the market's down, but people do it anyway. So why do you think that is? I think it's just, human nature. You start panicking, you start getting worried, you start thinking, what is this money for? I need it to retire. And oh my gosh, it's the stock market's down 5%, 10%, 20%. You, you start getting into these bigger numbers, people start getting more and more panicky. Even the small declines, people start panicking. And you see it with, with money outflows from mutual funds going into cash holding positions with giant corporations. And it's not necessary because if you're invested over the long term and you're invested and you're diversified, you can weather these, I, I wouldn't even call them storms, these normal interactions with the market. Um, and, and I think what doesn't help is that there's certainly not enough uh, financial education that everybody should just have to understand what is normal in a common market. It's going to go up, it's going to go down, that's part of the equation. And if you knew that going into it, you would say maybe 5, 10, 15% is not just something I should be worried about, it's, it's something I shouldn't be worried about because it's normal. Um, and I think another thing, I don't know, Daniel, if you want to talk about is, you know, people see things on you know, TV, they read about it in the newspaper, and that kind of ramps up their emotions as well. Right. I remember, I forget what year it was, but it was the worst January ever. Yeah, 2016. Yep. Could you imagine seeing your portfolio mm -hmm. drop and then start reading headlines like, worst January ever, get out now. Right. And I think that's when I think about it, it's because, first of all, people think the market's going to fall further. So you get out now before it does. But then second, it's I think a lot of it is I am a believer that in order to be a stock investor in the first place, you need to have a fundamental belief that the stock market goes up over time, that companies will continue to increase their earnings and their profits over time and that their share prices will reflect that. And I think a lot of people don't have that belief. They look at the stock market like a casino where you have to predict which stocks are going to perform well and which ones are going to do poorly, or you have to predict the right time to get in and out of the market. And I like to reiterate to people, as I mentioned early on in this show, look, you don't have to predict anything to have a successful investment experience. You just have to basically own a diversified stock and bond portfolio and then ride through <laughs> these declines. And it's simple, but it's not easy. Um, but as long as you have that fundamental belief that, okay, yes, maybe there's some stuff going on right now that's scary, but in the long run, business people are going to figure it out and they're going to figure out a way to, to increase their profits over time. And my share prices are going to go back, not just to where they were, but where, but beyond where they were before the market declined. And all financial advice is not the same. If you listen to radio and TV ads about investment, you sell them sitting when saying invest in passive funds. It's always invest in something or other that has fees. And usually, or very often, it's uh, uh, the stock market's been going up. How are you going to protect your investment so that, that they're asserting, at least uh, subtly, that they have the ability to uh, do what we say you don't have, which is to predict downturns. So again, yeah. some, of the, some of the advice is counterproductive and it's encouraging you to do this uh, uh, short-term uh, bad behavior. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I feel like one of the fundamental, one of the biggest jobs we have on this radio show is almost counteracting a lot of the, I consider it nonsense and just bad advice that's out there that most of, of the financial advice and financial media I industry is centered around things like market timing and stock picking and not to pick on anyone, but you know, you watch like Jim Cramer's show on TV and he's talking about 
which individual stocks to pick and which ones are, are good and which ones you should sell from your portfolio. And people listen to that stuff and he is compelling and he seems like a smart guy. Uh, oddly enough that someone did research and they analyzed the performance of all his stock picks and he's he significantly underperformed the standard in Poor's 500. And like I said, that's not to pick on him. It's just one example of someone who has a following and honestly sabotages uh, investors with just misleading advice or misguided advice. Um, so this is a li I guess you could call it market timing oriented, but we have a text. It's from Jim and he said, please address how the stock market has traditionally behaved in general in an election year versus say the year before or after an election year. So I would say it's probably not that different. I think there, I, I honestly, I remember somewhere that I think it tends to be a little more volatile in an election year, which kind of makes sense because people are, are generally, they're following the election and they're trading based on that information in the short run. But from an expected return standpoint, I don't know of any research, but I'd be very surprised if it was different than the long run average. Uh, I, again, <laughs> I, I don't have information about the stock market, but there have been some, uh, uh, what might be called political economy studies about uh, how economies behave. And not surprisingly, uh, people running for reelection want the economy to be good. So there's a, a tendency towards more expansionary kind of policies during the uh, period preceding an election year. That, that's a very weak kind of relationship, but uh, that's certainly uh, something that politicians would care about. And I will say, even if we had the data in front of us and we could look and see, okay, well, here's the, the returns of any election year. I'm assuming he's talking about presidential elections. And here's the returns of just the market on average. Even if they're different, I'm not sure you could even draw a conclusion from that because I'm not sure there would be enough election years, enough data to really draw a meaningful conclusion. Because when you're dealing with a relatively small data set, you can see results that seem significant, but they're really not. Like I know uh, an example was, I think it was someone at Dimensional Fund Advisors wrote an article, and it might have been an ex-employee. I, I can't remember exactly, but he wrote about this exact issue, and it was basically comparing returns of Democratic presidents during their uh, reign versus of the returns when a Republican president is in office. And if you look, the returns have actually been better for Democratic presidents. And so uh, his whole premise was that, look, you can't draw conclusions from this. It's not statistically significant. And he showed some other examples. Like one is, if you look at the returns of left, when left-handed presidents were in office, yeah. they absolutely trounced the returns of presidents who were right-handed when they were in office. So that's one of the issues with with investing in general is, you're dealing with a relatively small data set. You have millions of people looking at the same data, slicing and dicing it a million different ways, and inevitably you find things that seem like a profitable trading strategy or seem like they're meaningful, and they really are just sheer randomness. Yeah, I think we, again, uh, your father may be uh, less in tune with us than, than we are, but I think we believe the market actually uh, discounts a lot of these things. So, so yep. let's say you have candidate A who's highly going to be highly favorable for the stock market and candidate B, candidate B is really going to be bad for the stock market. What do you do? Well, the market's going to weigh the probabilities of A winning versus B winning and the market's going to come in someplace in the middle there. So unless you know who's going to win, you're not going to uh, benefit by trying to make a guess on it. That's exactly right. So a simple way to explain that is expectations for what's going to happen in the future are already going to be somewhat reflected in the current stock price. So even if, if you knew something bad was going to happen a week from now, you wouldn't sell out of the stock market in anticipation of that because it, the price would already be down to reflect that. Unless you're That's, the only one that knows. If you're the only one. Yeah, exactly. But you, it's very unlikely that anyone here is going to know more than the whole market. And, and if it's with an individual company, then you can get arrested for yeah. trading on, <laughs> on that information if you're the only one who knows. Okay, so the next mistake that people make is investing based on past performance. Who wants to take this one? I, I can start if you want. Um, I think it's natural to say, well, here's my lineup, for example, my 401k, and I'm just gonna pick the ones that perform the best and not consider anything else. Uh, things that you know seem natural to do, like, oh, I'm just gonna make sure I get the best return. The problem with that is that we don't know if the fund that we've just chosen now in our 401k is going to continue to perform the same way and have that same performance next year, or the next five or 10 years. Uh, there's great research that shows that a lot of times the top performers 
aren't the top performers after a few years. And it's, it's a natural progression. And I know uh, Dimensional Funds did some data digging on that, and they pulled out some great research. I'll have to look it up. Dave, you may know some of it. But um, just simply choosing past performance is no way to get future good results in your returns. Right. I mean, there's a reason it's a disclosure that you hear on every financial news outlet, every commercial you see on TV for investment companies. It's a, it's a disclosure because it's true. Yeah. And but, so strategies work in some situations, they don't in others. So there's an article in today's Wall Street Journal, they interview the, the unfortunately, the, the man who has the worst performance of the year, way, way down at the very, very bottom. And uh, a couple of years ago, he was at the top. So if your strategy works in one environment, it, it probably is not going to be very good in, in another kind of environment. So again, that kind of uh, middle course of passing investment avoids those kind of uh, fluctuations up and down. Right. And and I think on that note, what you, what you can run into is a trap of you pick funds based on past performance, then they do poorly over the next block of time because they just, whatever their strategy was, happened to just do well over the, the past several years. Now that goes out of favor, whatever their strategy is. So you get rid of those and you replace them with other people that did better over you know that several year period and you just constantly churn your account and it just leads to disappointing results and you end up just consistently basically buying high and selling low and just re repeating in, until you're broke. Um, you know, the other note I want to make on this is that long periods of time in human terms, like when I think of like a human lifetime, 10 years seems like a long time, a decade. It's like, okay, well, that's probably an eighth of most people's life or close to it. In investment terms, that's very close to meaningless. So it tells you very little. So a lot of times people will think, well, yeah, I get that the last two or three years doesn't make much of a difference or doesn't tell me much. But this guy's beat his benchmark for 10 or 15 years straight. Uh, there's no way that's randomness. That, that can't be luck. Uh, he's got something figured out. And even 10 or 15 year periods are not nearly long enough to draw a conclusion about what will happen in the future. Whether it's a particular fund or even an asset class or a, a sector that's done well. You know, an example is the last... 10 years or so, the Standard & Poor's 500 index, which is basically the 500 largest companies in the U.S., has pretty much trounced every other asset class. Uh, I think the exception might be real estate, but uh, any other stock asset class has basically been crushed by the S&P 500. I think a lot of people who have been investing over the last several years are starting to second guess owning things like international companies, owning things like um, small companies, or value companies, things that we invest in in our portfolios and talk about on the radio show is good ideas for being a, a diversified investor. Uh, they've led to disappointment for almost 10 years now. And it's natural to look at that. And you know, even if you really, at the beginning of that, were a staunch believer in diversification, think, well, maybe I should just put all my money in the S&P 500. Yeah. Well, diversification doesn't mean always on the upside. Uh, so again, uh, international stocks for a long time have been people thought was uh, maybe a, a better area than uh, domestic, but then the la as you said, the last 10 years, uh, it hasn't, but you've, it's given you some stability. It might, might give you stability in the future if things turn around. So again, you're not, diversification doesn't necessarily increase your return. It uh, gives you more stability over the long run. Exactly. And, and so I think just the, the key takeaway here is just one, past performance doesn't predict future results and two, even relatively long periods of time, still don't predict the future. So it's really just an all around bad idea to make investment decisions based on past performance. Yep. So the third uh, item, and I think Dr. Gertz might have some interesting perspective on this, is buying expensive or complex financial products. Um, I think a lot of investors are just inherently attracted to expensive or, or complex investment products because they, they basically look at those as, as proxies for sophistication. That's kind of the way I think of it. Uh, my question is, it seems especially prevalent on the institutional investor side. Is that yeah. the case? I'm, I'm not sure it's, it's especially so, but it's certainly uh, uh, a very uh, serious kind of thing. And again, in, uh, small investors don't have, maybe have the, uh, the shield against uh, private equity and uh, uh, complicated hedge funds and things of that sort because they, they don't have access to them. So, but again, uh, uh, institutional investors, I don't think, are, are a whole lot different from individuals. They're, they're looking for 
uh, opportunities uh, nowadays that if you go to uh, uh, a, a meeting of uh, dealing with pension funds or foundations or something of that sort, they, they start by saying, well, uh, expected rates of return have come down. You, you have the actuarial expectations of earning 7%, but you can't do that with a traditional mix. So we have this wonderful kind of uh, product that will get you back up there. And again, uh, it's probably not true, but if it is true, the only way they could do it was a, with a substantial increase in risk. So again, there's always a, a kind of long-term trade-off. The, the higher the expected return, usually the, the more risky the investment is. So there's this uh, a kind of, uh, almost every year, this new product. Now it's uh, direct lending. Uh, again, uh, fortunately, we don't have the, uh, no one's coming asking us for direct lending. Into right. that, but there are direct lending, uh, all kinds of things like that that occur. And the argument is, well, uh, you somehow can do better than the market because we have this specialized niche area here and you have some advantage. But again, it also goes back to the idea of overconfidence. Uh, I think everyone knows that it used to be that uh, people said, well, you can only, um, you, you might get some advantage in active investment if you go into small cap and things of that sort. But now almost across the board, uh, passive beats active over the long run, but everyone assumes, well, I'm not just the average investor, I'm the, the smart investor. So even though 75% uh, of the funds underperform, I'm gonna choose the 25% that uh, overperforms, uh, beats its uh, uh, benchmark, including fees. Well, uh, everyone thinks they're smart, but uh, few of us actually have that ability. So again, I think there's a combination of the same thing we talked about over, uh, over optimism and also the fact that people are trying to sell something and, and selling complicated products the way of uh, of uh, doing it yep and we have a couple calls so i'm going to go ahead and go to stan on line one stan good you're morning, on the air gentlemen. good morning good morning gentlemen uh it's a great sunny day you want to be warm again today i got 84 on my car for car for longer. but anyway <laughs> Uh, you touched on one of my favorite memes when I was a uh, talk show host myself. I no longer am. But that is the reality that if you look at the stock market rates of returns, the Dow Jones since 1896 when it started, up until very recently, I haven't included the Trump administration, but very recently, more than 100% of the growth in the uh, value uh, the Dow Jones came from Democratic uh, administration. However, after you said that, you said you can't really use that as an example because that's not uh, a long enough period of time. But in fact, that's not correct. Suppose if you go from the, uh, January the 1st of a, of a uh, inauguration year, to January the 1st of the next inauguration year, and you go through all of those years, all of those years are included in that growth rate because the Democratic administration is a better rate of return than than a Republican administration. Well, I think the, the, the issue there is, again, uh, it may be just spurious kind of correlation. If you look at the last three administrations, last um, four administrations, uh, the Clinton administration did really great in terms of the stock market because you had the 90s uh, really uh, uh, really uh, extremely strong stock market. Uh, George W. Bush did poorly because he came in with a recession and ended with a financial crisis. And then Obama uh, started from a really, really low point, And that was really a great performance. And so far, Trump has had a great performance. So, But that's not the same thing as saying they caused it. I don't, I don't think that... Uh, uh, Obama caused the uh, rebound. I mean, they, they helped it, but uh, the, it came in at the right time. And Trump may have been lucky as well. So I, I, right. I, I, it's more a matter of luck with a small sample. And so the point I was trying to make is, and the point that the, the author of the article I was talking about was trying to make is, it's never a good idea to make investment decisions based on who's in the White House. Because if you look at all presidents, really on average, you've had positive investment returns in pretty much, you know, regardless of whether you have a Democrat in office or a Republican in office, chances are you're going to have positive investment returns over their uh, their tenure. And if you, if you followed your strategy, though, uh, what would have happened? Uh, you had uh, Democrats doing better than Republicans. The, the night that uh, that uh, Trump uh, won the election, 
uh, there was panic. Uh, the, the futures were down 800 or 1,000 points during the night. And you might say, well, I should get out here. We're going to have a Republican instead of a Democrat. But it turns out, uh, again, probably not necessarily to the credit of the president, we've had a fantastic stock market the last uh, two and a half years. Yep. So, yeah, it, it has been a long time, uh, period of time. But like I said, it, it's maybe not long enough to draw a conclusion that, hey, we know because there is a Democrat in office, returns are going to be better than if there were uh, a Republican in office. And really, like I said, the fundamental takeaway is don't tra don't change your portfolio allocation based on who's in the office. Don't don't reduce your equity allocation because a Republican gets elected or vice versa. So we have another caller on line two. Uh, we'll go ahead and we have about one or two minutes. We have Bob. Bob, thanks for calling. Yeah, good morning. Real quick. I was listening to a financial show in the Chicago line area. It comes on every Saturday. And, and this, this guy was a, supposed to be a, a financial expert in, in the area up there. But anyway, he was really bashing basically advisors or people that actually have diversified funds said basically what he said was he said that's just kind of a backup plan for an idiot where do you <laughs> i didn't quite understand where he was going with that i mean any ideas why he would i mean no i'm sure he's just trying to sensationalize and basically get people to listen to him but um i think for someone to suggest that people should not be diversified is a little bit irresponsible um most people i mean even professionals are seemingly unable to consistently pick winning stocks or time the market. And that's just borne out in the evidence when you look at even professional investors underperforming passive benchmarks. So I don't know, I'm sure he's just, everyone's got their theories. Um, but I think it's just, like I said, irresponsible advice to tell someone to concentrate their portfolio and ignore diversification. So we're gonna have to go ahead and wrap up the show. Thank you for listening. Um, this has been Paul Rudy's On The Money Radio Show and we'll pick up in a, another couple weeks. Join us for the second and fourth Tuesday of each month.